Hello, are we here? Hi, Claire. Nice to see you. Hi, Brian. You too. So um, as you can see, I've got your reading copy behind me, and I've just finished rereading your book, which was really worthwhile because the first reading of it was a good experience, but it's such a rich text with so many different layers of things going on. It was really genuinely valuable to read it again. So I, I wonder if we could start with just some ground clearing, because I think people probably have some misconceptions about what's implied by your title. And I have this idea because I've been looking at some responses to our conversation on Twitter, where people have been more or less guessing or speculating about what they thought your book was about. And uh, so the title is, just to repeat, it's Intact, A Defense of the Unmodified Body. And just to give you my impression, I think what some people have done is they've made a sort of switch in their head where they've translated this into a different title, something like intact, an attack on the modified body. <laughs> and so maybe they, maybe they think you're arguing against the permissibility of modifying your body, like getting a tattoo, for example. I saw someone who uh, is writing a book on the history of tattooing was just really upset on, on Twitter and thought that you must be opposed to tattoos or uh, getting a piercing or shaving your legs. And what I think a lot of people are concerned about is the possibility that you might be arguing against the permissibility of someone who's transgender pursuing a surgery either to address dysphoria about their body or, or, or just to bring their body in alignment with their sense of self. And in reading your book, it's just very clear that that's, that's not what you're arguing. So I wanted to start by giving you an opportunity to explain what you see as some of the differences between defending the unmodified body, and we'll talk about how literally we should take that phrase, and this other idea of attacking the modified body as something to be avoided. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks for that question. Thank you for your kind words about the book. And thank you, Anthony, for the invitation and the really kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, Brian, yes, you're right. The title, the subtitle is A Defense of the Unmodified Body. And so the obvious question then is, what is an unmodified body? And an unmodified body in the sense that I'm using it isn't a literal thing. It isn't a body that has never been changed. How could that be? Anytime we do anything, we eat, we drink, we sit, we stand, we exercise, we don't exercise. We are doing things that change how our bodies are. So that's not what I mean by the unmodified body. By the unmodified body, I mean something quite specific and I mean it as a political principle. So the unmodified body, is the body that is allowed to be okay just as it is, that is allowed to be good enough. And that's a very simple, very modest kind of claim on the one hand, but it's also a very radical claim on the other hand, because um, I think we are overwhelmed with the message that our bodies are not good enough just as they are. It's really expected that we will experience our bodies as inadequate, as failing. I think all of us can readily state ways that our bodies could be improved, perhaps should be improved. Um, in fact, I think it's really rare for us to feel that our bodies need no improvement. We might think that somebody who thought that was you know, arrogant or, or suspect and so on. If I said my body is perfect, nothing needs to be changed. Right? Culturally, that seems very wrong. So the unmodified body is the idea of a body that is allowed to be good enough just as it is. And then you raise the question of, well, where does that stand, the actual modifications that we might want to take? You know, shouldn't we be able to choose to do all kinds of things? And that's absolutely right. We do have the right to try to change our bodies. And it's not part of my argument either to ask, argue that that permission shouldn't be granted or that people do anything wrong necessarily in pursuing various kinds of body modification. So I think we have the right to change our bodies, um, but we also have the right to live in a society that doesn't constantly tell us that the bodies that we have are wrong. And I think that when everybody feels bad about our bodies, uh, then perhaps it's not the bodies that are the real problem, it's the social context. So, so the really important point that I want to emphasize is that the choices we make to modify our bodies aren't made in a vacuum. They're made in this context of a kind of constant barrage of messages telling us we should feel worried about our bodies and ashamed of them. And it's that pressure to modify that I want us to fight against, not necessarily any particular practice of modification. One thing I appreciate about your training and background is that really you're a political philosopher. And my training is sort of in a branch of analytic philosophy that's about these applied cases. And sometimes it's hard for me to see the broader structures that are maybe impinging on the, the cases I want to analyze, but you're always zooming out to this structural account of what's going on. So when you refer to these social pressures, these messages we're all getting to modify our body, these aren't random messages. 
you talk about the messages as really having a, a, um, a purpose according to certain ideologies. So they serve sexist purposes and racist purposes and so forth. So I wonder if you could fill out a little bit this structure within which you're analyzing the body modification so that we can start to get a sense of the, the forest and not just the trees. Absolutely, good. Okay, so I think that we, Perhaps are all aware that we are living in a culture that places enormous emphasis on how we look, right? That's a sort of truism that we live in a context where we have constant emphasis on the selfie, the image, the photograph, on, on social media, on ranking of the image. We have a very visual culture and that's only become even more um, the case over the pandemic with the kind of focus on video conferencing, for example, where we look at our own images as we speak to other people in a way that is really unprecedented. But in the book, in Intact, I argue that that visual culture is part of what psychologists diagnose as an epidemic of appearance anxiety. That appearance anxiety is something that hangs in the air and affects all of us. Um, and it really has serious impacts on our, on our mental health. And you can see that in the empirical research. So one study that I cite in the book, a really large study found that 70% um, of women feel media pressure to have a perfect body and two thirds of men feel ashamed of their body. So in one sense, we have this um, atmosphere of bodily inadequacy that affects all of us, that is all pervasive and strongly affects all of us, men, women, and children. But on the other hand, the ways in which our bodies are supposed to adapt to change, to fit standards are not sort of neutral. So the Images and the ideals of how body should be are strongly dependent on and reflective of existing inequalities and discriminatory um, practices. So ideas about how bodies should be strongly relate to norms of gender and sex. They strong, are often strongly racialized and reflect racialized hierarchies. They tend to strongly um, reflect ideals of disability or non-disability and difference. And they tend to be also structured along lines that reflect class and age. So the idea that age, again, is something that we should be avoiding, particularly if we're women and so on. So the ideals of how our body should be and how we should look reflect and reinforce some of these really strong social, structural, political um, phenomena. And that means, I think, that the pressures to change our body, the pressures to fit in and to make our bodies fit into these discriminatory norms are just very clearly political in a very familiar sense. One example that you raise in the book, and you have really most of a chapter on this, is the notion of disability. And so I can imagine someone listening to what you're saying and thinking, well, if you've got some sort of normal or average or typical body, surely you shouldn't be uh, under pressure to change it in any kind of a way. And so your, your, your argument goes through there, but they say, well, if somebody has a disability, surely there should, there's a presumption that they should change their body because what is a disability if not something that um, is a lack or something that suggests a need for change? And you have a really a long discussion showing some of the weaknesses in this way of thinking about things having to do not only with the, the, the concept of disability, but um, the way that changing our body relates to that concept. So could you talk a little bit about how you discuss the concept of disability and why it's not somehow a counterexample to your overall argument? Yeah, of course. So you're right. So one thing you might want to say as an objection to my argument, and you know, as it's a book of philosophy, I proceed by considering objections and putting objections to myself and trying to show the way through those objections. So one objection you might have to my argument is precisely what you say, that the demand to change your bodies is in some cases entirely appropriate. If we want our bodies to be healthy, we want to avoid disability, we want to avoid illness. And in response to that, the chapter on disability tries to really question what we are doing when we label bodies as disabled or not. And it's closely related to the idea, as you um, highlighted in your question, the idea of normality and the idea of what is a normal body. And that idea of a normal body is something that you see cropping up in in health, in medicine, in clinical treatment of bodies very often. You see it on um, the NHS website, for example, when they talk about the um, how the NHS National Health Service in the UK will provide um, plastic or reconstructive surgery when necessary to restore normality, um, but they won't provide cosmetic surgery, which people want to create a, an enhanced body or something like that. And so that idea of normality, I think, is really worth looking at. It's worth thinking about philosophically and asking really what it would mean to have a normal body. And there's different ways we might think of normality. One way we might think of normality when we're thinking about issues of disability, impairment, health and functioning is we might say something like 
well, a normal body is a body that is like others, that can do what other bodies can do, that it has some kind of objective standard of normality. But of course, that standard of normality just won't work because our bodies are fundamentally different in a whole host of ways. Um, the obvious example here is that male bodies and female bodies are different uh, and female bodies can do things that male bodies can't do and vice versa. So why don't we describe um, the male body's inability to, to get pregnant and to gestate and birth a fetus and a baby as a disability? Why don't we describe that as a, as, as a lack or as a health problem? Well, it's because we think that it's, it's normal for a male body not to be able to do those things. So we're already applying a judgment about what's normal and abnormal for different kinds of bodies to do. But of course, for disabled people, particularly people who have a disability from birth or from a very early age, then their bodies are absolutely normal for them too. Right? For each of us, if we have lived in a body that's roughly as it is from birth, that's grown and developed in a way that's predictable, then our bodies are normal for us. So the question then is, where does an idea of a standard body, the idea of a, a normal body, where does that come from and where does it take us? And I think it always is going to reflect values. It's going to reflect cultural and social political values about what we think um, we expect of bodies. Some features that um, in some contexts are understood as disabilities are in other contexts not understood as disabilities. Um, some features that are viewed as differences or, or even you know, um, as lacks in some contexts are, could be viewed as um, abilities in other contexts. So one example here is the fact of um, people, some people who are born with an additional finger, right? So they might have six fingers rather than five. Now that characteristic is typically treated in a, in a westernized context as being um, a lack, a disability, a problem, and that typically um, parents will be offered surgery for their children to remove that extra finger so that the child looks more like a, a, normal, a normal child. But of course, you could equally see that having an additional finger is an ability, it's an extra skill, it's an extra um, contribution to, to dexterity and to functioning. So whether we see something as a disability, as an impairment, as a as a health condition, as an abnormality, or whether we see it as an enhancement, as a feature, or just part of normal diversity, that is all, that's all cultural, it's all political too. Part of how you discuss this in the book is you mentioned the notion of a reference class and how do we decide what the reference class is, even just for doing our statistics. So in addition to talking about people who might be born with an extra finger, you talked about people who are, are deaf or blind. And the interesting thing is we might think, well, blindness is clearly a disability. It's the inability to see. But of course, what's your reference class? For people who are blind, that's normal for them, as you say. And so the idea is, is as I was reading you, that often the reference class, the implicit reference class, is something like a, a white, male, able-bodied person of a certain age or something like that, which is implicitly taken as the, the normal standard. And you know, there have been these critiques coming out about um, crash test dummies are designed mm -hmm. with that size in mind and, you know, medical devices are designed with that size in mind. So it's really this, this implicit reference class, as I, as I took you to be saying, that is, is kind of pulling the strings behind what we think normal is and therefore what we think abnormal is. That's exactly right. And you see it in lots of contexts, uh, not just in the context of, of disability and impairment. So another example that I open the book with, which, because I find this so completely fascinating, is the idea that women who have just had a baby should try to get their body back. This idea of getting your body back, right? This phrase, which is yeah. a really ubiquitous common phrase. Um, everyone knows what it means. Getting your body back means becoming slimmer again after pregnancy. But the phrase isn't getting slimmer after pregnancy or getting attractive after pregnancy or getting sexy after pregnancy. It's getting your body back, right? And what that suggests then is that they're, the body that you have after childbirth is not really your body. It's not your authentic body, right? It's some kind of imposter, some kind of abnormal or inauthentic you. And what you need to do is get your real authentic body back. And so what is your authentic body according to that phrase? Well, a woman's real authentic body is the body she has post puberty, pre-pregnancy, which for an average woman might be a period of something between 10 and 20 years of a 80 year lifespan. It's already, you know, a small period of a woman's life if you look at average lifespan and so on. But yet that is 
construed that but that kind of body that phase of life is understood as your body getting your real body back and I think that kind of imagery just does so much work in showing this strong pressure that we place on ourselves to fit into a particular really narrow mold and in fact the way that we very often feel shame um, really quite significant shame if we don't conform and if we don't put the work in that's needed to to sit in that narrow mold. Yeah, and I think one way you could be misinterpreted is people thinking that the implication of what you've just said is that we therefore shouldn't modify our bodies. And just to stay with the example of disability, I want to read a quote that uh, comes from, I don't know, page 193 of your book that's about, about this mistaken interpretation of your view, as I'll suggest. So um, you're right. My argument is not that modification is always wrong or even that it is presumptively suspect. The unmodified body is neither a goal to be attained nor a purity to be preserved. I no more want to attach shame to a modified body than I want to defend its attachment to non-modification. And so in the context of disability, you say some bodies are easier to live with than others, either because of intrinsic properties of the body or because of social circumstances or some combination. And you write that body modification may significantly enhance a person's quality of life under realistic conditions. And there's nothing inherently wrong with um, seeking such modifications. And then here's where you, you put it in context. You say, so, so this isn't an argument against modification. At the same time, there's a long and continuing history of treating people with disabilities poorly, even as less than human. And so against this context of discrimination, you say the political principle of the unmodified body states that there's value in the unmodified body no matter what it looks like or what it can do, and that respecting this value is part of what it means to treat people equally. So I wanted to pause on this notion of people's equal moral value, because that seems to be something that's really central to your construction of this political principle, not the literal sense of an unmodified body, but this political sense of the unmodified body having value. You tie that to the notion of moral equality, and I wonder if you could talk more about that. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So that's right. So I think that we actually we do have the right to try to change our bodies. I think that for us as individuals, um, changing our bodies or trying to do that in various ways can sometimes be incredibly um, enriching. It can be a source of creativity. It can be a source of sort of it can be life affirming. It can be a source of self-care. It can also be an act of modification can also be our, the best um, strategy we have to fit in with the demands that that life places on us, right? So that as an indi at the individual level, that absolutely can be the best strategy. What's important though, if we're thinking about pursuing modification for ourselves is to be really clear about what we think the outcome is going to be, right? And so when we're thinking about different practices of body modification, we might have a couple of different kinds of goals in mind. One might be what we think our body will look like after the practice. Um, and that may be more or less easy to predict. But another one will be what we think, how we think we will feel after the modification, right? How we think having that different body will make us feel. Will it make us feel at ease? Will it make us feel happier? Will it make us feel more confident? And it's just really important to be clear that those two things are different. And that in many cases, having a changed body doesn't necessarily get rid of the, the feeling of, of dissatisfaction with the body. But one of the reasons that I don't want to argue that changing the body is, is wrong is that to argue that would be to make an incredibly, um, again, discriminatory statement, because of course our bodies fit differently with the standards placed on them. So we talked about earlier about how the standards of how bodies should be are often highly discriminatory, often reflect existing hierarchies of, of gender, race, age, class, and, and more disability status and so on. And so if you were to say, well, the, a body is better if it's unmodified, then what you would do then is to say, you know, it's, it's much, we'd be praising people who have bodies that society deems don't need much modification. And that wouldn't be a position that in any way feeds into equality. So the connection with equality here for me is that if we are, um, in the grip of a really dominant social context that tells us that our bodies aren't good enough and that tells us that our bodies ought to change to reflect our sort of our, our, our virtue, our moral status, our identity, something um, ethical of that kind, then what that really is telling us is that we are not good enough as we are. And when the standards of um, bodily acceptability are discriminatory as they are, then that is a fundamental undermining of equality because it says 
your body is not good enough and the way in which it is not good enough is a way that reflects these existing structures of, of hierarchy and domination. So I think that's just a really clear message there. So on the one hand, right, we all feel that our bodies are not good enough. It's a universal experience. And that might make you think that there's no problem of equality here. But the problem of equality is that we don't have these, um, these experiences equally, that the norms we are trying to adhere to are themselves discriminatory and not equal. And also I think often we don't experience this problem is something that affects all of us. So one of the concepts I use in the book is this idea of, of, of shame or shame tenance, as I call it. So shame tenance is the combination of shame and, and maintenance. So shame tenance are the things that we do when we maintain the idea that our bodies are shameful as they are and that we ought to change them. And we engage in shame tenance when we actively shame somebody for how they look or when we contribute you know, privately and silently to the idea that certain features of body should be hidden, should be not discussed, should be kept um, out of view. And I discuss all kinds of examples of, of shame tenants that range from quite clear examples, like the fact that it's absolutely common in, you know, virtually all cultures to keep menstruation private and secret or even taboo, to much more, um, uh, much less obvious examples of shame, um, and some examples that I talk about might include uh, makeup or natural makeup and, and bodybuilding. We could maybe talk about those if you want to, but I'm aware I'm yeah. going at length at your response. And my, the point about the shame um, aspect is that I think we tend to experience our bodies as failing, but we experience that as a personal failing that is shameful to us as individuals rather than as just the human condition. Um, and again, that's feeding into a sense of, of inequality and, and inadequacy. Okay, so I want to follow up on that. And then I, I do have a note here that I want to talk about what you call natural bo bodybuilding as distinct from non natural bodybuilding. And I think it, some interesting lessons come out of that distinction. But earlier, you were saying, you know, when you are contemplating making a change to your body, you, you have some questions you should ask, you should ask, how do I think I'll feel? What do I imagine I will look like and that it's important to have some sort of critical reflection on those on those types of questions. And I happen to write down some, some other questions that you propose a person should ask. I'll say what these questions are, and then I'll, I'll ask you a question about the question. So um, you say, uh, the questions to ask yourself if you're considering modifying your own body are, to what extent are your actions shaped by or reacting to dominant social norms? How are you acting autonomously? And how are you pushed toward this modification? Is this modification necessary for you to gain social status or acceptance? Are you pursuing this modification as the result of socially induced shame, as you were just discussing? Uh, do the social pressures that you're reacting to fit within a structure of norms and institutions that undermine your equality, what we were just discussing as well? Um, does the modification that feels necessary to you harm or enhance your health? Will it make you feel better? What's the evidence for that? And so forth. Now, these all seem like good questions to ask, but I think it points to something that could potentially be a tension in how you conceive of this political principle of the unmodified body. And one is that sometimes in your book, it sounds like you're saying uh, the principle of the unmodified body is a political principle, and therefore it's a matter of collective action to change social structures and norms. Now, of course, individuals have to do things to change social structures and norms. They don't change themselves. So it's not that there's an either or here. But other times, especially when you have all these questions a person is meant to ask themselves, it can sometimes seem like what falls out of the principle of the unmodified body is something like a personal responsibility as well. Some sort of obligation that each of us has to be critical of our own motivations, to inquire into what we think is really going on when we feel inclined to modify our bodies. So is it, is it an either or, or an and both thing? Um, or do you see this as, as this individual thing as being an entailment of the principle? How are these related to each other? Yeah, thank you so much. So you're absolutely right that I argue both that what we need really is, is collective action. This isn't a problem that can be solved by us acting individually, but that collective action is made of individuals, right? That's how we do things. Um, now, what am I trying to do with the book? Well, it's, I guess, I would remind um, you that I'm a philosopher, right? That's that's my 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 um, my expertise, and so a fundamental way that I think about problems is in terms of how we think about them, and how we discuss them together. And I think that is often the very first step towards any kind of sort of social change. So what I hope a reader will think when 
she or he or they read this book is that I hope that some of the arguments of my book will really sort of speak to their experience, right, will resonate and seem exactly right, and that some readers will think, yeah, this is exactly how I feel, but that other parts of the book, I expect, will, will feel not right, will feel surprising, will feel um, controversial or, un, or, or sort of shocking in some way. And I'm expecting that for different readers, the, the different parts of the book that prompt that reaction, you know, will differ, right? And I think that that process of reading and engaging and thinking about um, ideas as we do in philosophy and thinking about ideas that are from both familiar and, and unfamiliar is a really important first step towards social change, right? I have, that's perhaps an idealistic view, but I, ha I do have that, have that view. So I want the book to empower the reader, all, all of us, to, as I put it at the very end of the book, to, to say stop, right? To understand the ways that the pressures and the social norms of bodily inadequacy are working on us and are harming us collectively, and to start to think about ways to resist, again, that the pressure rather than the practices individually. So I hope that readers will be able to do that. I hope that that starts a conversation. I don't see the book as ending a conversation. Philosophy is never finished. That's the beauty and the curse of philosophy. It's never finished. It's not the end of a conversation, but it's what I hope will be the start of a conversation. And that's really why I think those questions that you read out from the book are useful because we might each think about those questions without necessarily being able to be sure about what the answers are, right? That's, that's one of the questions, isn't it? How do we know why we act as we act? How do we know what the outcome of acting in certain ways will be? It's a difficult question, but if we start to question, start to think, discuss and debate, then I think we have the excellent um, tools for trying to to undermine some of these harmful, damaging pressures that I've been discussing. Yeah, and just one little coda to that. It's interesting that you say, even if we ask these questions and upon reflection, we think, you know, some large proportion of my motivation actually is due to problematic social pressures, pressures that are unjust or stem from unjust uh, forces. You don't, you don't then say, now you have an obligation not to modify your body. You know, you've done your homework, you asked yourself right. the list of questions, you've decided, oh, dang it, you know, I've really got, complicated motives here, some of which are problematic, therefore I'm somehow not entitled to modify my body. So, you know, it, it, you know, you can do this work maybe as part of this political project, but it doesn't follow from that, that therefore you must, you must uh, put the brakes on and you're not uh, therefore allowed to modify your body if you want. Right. So, I mean, firstly, when we ask ourselves these questions about particular practices modification, we might conclude that a particular practice is actually not something that we are undertaking from um, motives that are that are sort of ethically suspect. But even if we do think that a particular modification of practice is something that we want to undertake because it fits into unjust, unequal structures of <laughs> discriminatory social norms, that doesn't mean that it's not in our interests to, to comply, right? We are social beings. We are beings who want to fit in, who are dependent on acceptance from others for a great many things, including our self-esteem, but also a great many other material um, benefits. Uh, so there is absolutely no obligation on any individual to give up the benefits that she or he or they will receive from conforming to, to social norms. That's why it can't be a purely an individual question. It can't be that everybody has to read my book and then go away and stop doing all the things that they need to do in order to fit in and gain self-esteem and acceptance from within their, their context. That's not the argument at all. The question right. is, why is it that we are subjecting ourselves and each other to a constant sense of inadequacy and failure? What harm are we doing to ourselves with that context? And that harm is both a harm to our mental health, right? With, what I mentioned, the idea of appearance anxiety as being this reaching epidemic levels, but also potentially harm to our physical health. Some of the practices of modification I discuss in the book are, are risky or actively harmful to health. Not all, but some are. So there's good reason, I think, to, to take a step back and to just think about whether we can envisage moving together towards a situation where, as I say, we allow the body to be good enough just as it is. One thing I really love about your book is we're having a fairly high level conversation talking about principles and how exactly do these ideas relate to each other. 
But your book is so incredibly rich with examples, really concrete, messy, difficult examples, examples of things where people disagree about them, or they may feel uncomfortable even reflecting upon the examples and so forth. And so it isn't just a bunch of heady philosophical principles, you're doing some political philosophy, and then you, you reach for some examples to support your case. It seems to me that you've gone through the process of getting mired in these examples and, and having to have your political philosophy deal with the reality of some of that gravitational pull of some of these difficulties. So one example that's maybe more of a light hearted example is what you mentioned before about natural bodybuilding. Near the beginning of the book, you talk about going to a natural bodybuilding convention, I think it was. And you notice there's all sorts of paradoxes that are raised by this notion of natural bodybuilding and how that's supposed to be distinct from unnatural bodybuilding. So can you tell a little bit about that story and then you know, what are some of the reflections that we should take from it? Absolutely, yeah. So the book is divided into three parts, um, natural, normal, and whole. And the three parts are supposed to look at ways in which we typically sort of theorize or talk about the unmodified body, as I'm calling it, using other much more familiar ideas, the natural body, the normal body, the whole body. So the first one is natural. So I wanted to know what is a natural body? When we talk about naturalness with relation to the body, what is it? And the example that you refer to is natural bodybuilding. Now, natural bodybuilding was going to be just one really small example, a couple of paragraphs, a couple of pages. Um, but the more I researched it and the more I got into it, the more fascinating I found it. And it took over an entire paragraph. So, uh, sorry, entire chapter, sorry. So natural bodybuilding is bodybuilding, which does not use certain substances. Particularly, it doesn't use steroids and it doesn't use um, human growth hormone and insulin. And there's a particular list of substances that a natural bodybuilder must not use. But steroids are the most um, sort of fundamental um, forbidden substance for a natural bodybuilder. But the naturalness of natural bodybuilding is still not easy to grasp because a natural bodybuilder will typically use all kinds of very artificial processed substances and supplements. Um, both women and men do bodybuilding, but in the chapter I focus on the male bodybuilding because that's the, the most dominant form of the sport. So a natural bodybuilder will typically um, take all kinds of things such as you know, whey supplements, creatine, various kinds of very artificial processed supplements. And in the process of performing in the competition, which as you say, I went to a competition and I found it absolutely enlightening to, to change my way I was thinking about this sport. Um, again, there's lots of artifice there. So very, very high levels of fake tan to give a particular kind of appearance and highlighting the muscles, um, very strict rules about exactly how the body is presented. So what makes that natural? What's natural in natural bodybuilding? Well, the conclusion that I came to is that the naturalness there is that um, what it is for bodybuilder to be natural, the reason that steroids undermine natural bodybuilding, but whey powder and supplements and creatine don't, is that steroids are undermining this idea of a kind of authentic masculinity. So bodybuilding is, as I say, fundamentally a, a sport based on ideals of masculinity. Um, there is some really interesting work on how women fit into the sport, but masculinity is its dominating kind of ideal. And I think that steroids are basically interrupting that authentic masculinity because they're interrupting um, you know, the, as it were, the natural, have you used the word natural, the natural um, formulation of the male body through testosterone and work. And so it's a kind of importing that uh, masculinity in an artificial way. And that's, I think, what's doing the work here. And so from that, you can see that naturalness is very clearly related to ideals of, of, of value, to social structures. And you see that coming in in other ways that the concept is used, even though the concept might be seen to be used in very different ways. So um, another example I have in the book is natural hair. So natural hair is um, Afro textured hair that has not been straightened. And again, natural hair might have used all kinds of, of products of modifications. Natural hair may well be maybe colored. It may be um, almost certainly will be um, have a huge amount of time spent on it, braiding it, putting it into locks, all kinds of um, uh, complicated and beautiful work done on natural hair. So natural hair isn't hair that's just been left alone. Nothing has been done to it. Like with the bodybuilders, right? They don't just wake up one day and show their muscles. They put a huge amount of work into shaping their bodies. But natural hair, the reason that straightening undermines the naturalness of natural hair is because straightening of Afro textured hair is 
um, a response to a really racialized, racist conception of beauty that puts um, hair that typically white people have, straight hair as the only acceptable or beautiful form of hair. And so natural hair is resisting, right, that racist idea and that racist aesthetic. So natural bodybuilding, natural hair, they both use the concept of natural. Natural means something very different in both cases. One, it's about steroids. One, it's about straightening. In both cases, you can do all kinds of things to your body or your hair that don't make it unnatural. But in what they have in common is that the concept of naturalness is reflecting and invoking a social value, right? It's either invoking masculinity in one case or it's revoking um, a resistance to racism and, and a, a sort of black, black pride and black um, reclamation of the black aesthetic in the other. So I'm noticing it's a little after 742, which means we're supposed to turn to questions soon, but I wanna dwell just a little bit more on this bit of naturalness because you make a really interesting point. One is that you know, feminist thinkers and writers and philosophers have for a long time attacked the concept of natural because natural has often been wielded in ways that subjugate women and sexual minorities and gender minorities. So one way it happens is um, it's proclaimed that it's natural for women to want to spend all their time caring for children and it's natural for them not to uh, participate in the workplace and so forth. So if, if you were to ask any feminist on the street, what's their view of the concept of nature, many of them would reflexively uh, respond with some criticism or some skepticism of the notion. But interestingly, like you talk about shame tenants, you also talk about the notion of the natural as a frenemy, as something that mm -hmm. can be both your friend and your enemy, something that can be both uh, feminist and anti-feminist, depending on how the concept is wielded. So could you say a little bit about how you talk about the, the possibilities for reclaiming the concept of the natural mm -hmm. and potentially using that toward feminist ends? Absolutely, sure, yeah. So um, you're right, I talk about naturalness as a, as a frenemy and I show that sometimes that concept is used in a way that sort of contributes to oppression that pushes a, a dominant narrative forward more and sometimes it can be a concept that's used for resistance. So I think the idea of natural hair that I just talked about is an example of the concept of nature being used to resist. Um, discrimination and oppression, right? It's saying that a natural hair is a good thing. In other contexts, you have the idea of naturalness as, as you say, within the long history of patriarchy and sex inequality, you have nature being used to subordinate women and to suggest that women's place as subordinates is, is natural, right? Is, is, and therefore is somehow both sort of um, permanent that can't be changed, but also is right in some way. So nature brings with it that normative implication right when we talk about something as natural we tend to mean that it's something good which is why perhaps we talk about natural health and not natural disease right mm. that's not really a phrase we use we don't say oh, i've got a natural disease but we do say i'm pursuing natural health so there's this assumption that if something is natural it's good and so then calling something natural then heaps a certain assessment of, of that thing onto it so um Feminists have absolutely had to, as a fundamental part of feminist um, theory and activism, have had to really, really strongly resist the idea that women have a, a nature which explains and justifies their subordination. That has always been an important part of feminist thinking and activism, and still is today. The forms in which arguments for women's natural inferiority change. Um, you know, perhaps a contemporary form would be something like an argument based on theories of evolutionary psychology or something like that, right? With writers saying, no, there are, there are particular ways that women have a, a naturally different um, set of in, in, um, uh, intuitions or incentives or different neuropsychology or something, and that explains gender difference. So that remains an important part of feminist theory and activism to reject ideas that nature explains gender inequality and justifies gender inequality. But equally, an important part of feminist theory and activism has also always been to argue that embodiment is significant and embodiment matters. And that one part of um, women's experience of oppression is through their embodiment and through embodied experience. And that I think partly explains why some of the the, the, the debates and the toxicity about questions about gender identity and women's rights and trans people's rights has been so difficult within feminism because there is a really clear sense that feminism wants to say both that our social position should not be determined by our bodies, 
right, that nature or biology doesn't determine who we are and what we can do. And that fits really well with the idea that we should be recognizing, respecting, um, uh, recognizing and respecting trans identity and trans rights. It's a clear part of feminist thinking. But feminism has also wanted to say that embodiment makes a difference, makes a difference to people's experience, but also to people's social position, how we are treated socially. And that that is something that seems to suggest that we need to pay attention to um, that other aspect of our experience. So I think there's another example um, where nature and biology become very difficult questions. They can be used on both sides of a very difficult issue. And why we really need to be open to thinking about the complexity of these issues rather than dismissing them in a sort of simplistic way. Yeah. So I've got maybe one more question, but I, I probably should move to the Q&A session. I wonder if Anthony's going to give me some guidance here. Um, Anthony, do we have time for one more little question or uh, shall we move? Oh, I see there's a whole bunch of questions here in the Q&A. So let me just look at some of them. Um, okay, so the first question says, please address male circumcision. Well, that's something you and I both thought and written about and talked about a bunch. So surely we can talk about it. I'll actually use that to tie into my question, which was about intersex surgeries, which raises some, some similar questions. So uh, earlier, one thing I, I, I loved uh, about your book I mentioned was this notion of a reference class for what's normal and how the, the normal uh, reference class, class is may, may be a, a white male body or something like that. But many people will say, well, listen, the, the right reference class then is obviously what's normal for males is X, Y, and Z, and what's normal for females is X, Y, and Z. So we know what the reference class is because it's out there in nature. You have, you have the distinction. But the challenge that people with intersex traits pose to this distinction is that their bodies don't fit at least how we culturally want that distinction to line up with our social practices, with the look of our bodies, with how we treat people and so forth. And I think this gets to the notion of people's equal moral value. A lot of people who are born with intersex traits, even though that's what's normal for them, you know, people of intersex traits are normal for people with intersex traits, mm -hmm. but they're made to feel abnormal in a pathological way because they don't line up with the a, a different reference class. People want them to be either male or female according to the, you know, the, the classification criteria that we use. And so as a consequence of that, uh, surgeons will, for in many cultures in, in the UK and the United States, perform these rather radical surgeries on the genitals of these uh, intersex infants as a way of saying your body isn't good enough as it is. And so we're going to fix it. Now, the example of male circumcision is, is interestingly related to this, because at least in cultures with a high prevalence of infant circumcision, which is true of the United States, it's less true of England, there's a similar message sort of implied, you know, so a, a child is designated or, or reported to be male at, at birth. So, so now the thought is, this is somebody who's eligible to undergo a genital operation. Whereas if the child had been designated female at birth, whole bunch of laws would sweep right in and say, you mustn't operate on the child's genitals um, it, to any extent, unless it's medically necessary. So I think maybe there's an analogy here that, uh, you know, male children in the United States get the message, your body isn't good enough as it is, we need to kind of fix you. And so, you know, we can parlay this into questions about how do you assess children's bodily integrity and so forth, and maybe we'll do that, but could you just comment a little bit on intersex and male genital surgeries and, and the fact that, you know, these are quite common in so-called Western countries, whereas we tend to be rather incensed over modifications of the genitals of uh, children assigned female at birth. Yeah, sure. So in the book, I talk about lots and lots of different examples of body modification practices, ranging from very routine to very unusual, you know, separation of conjoined twins, ear piercing, makeup, you know, a whole range of procedures. And sometimes what I want to do is draw out similarities, commonalities in the way we treat these different procedures or the, the need for them. But sometimes what I want to do is draw out inconsistencies. And I think in the area of genital modification, there is a, just really clear glaring inconsistencies in the way we treat different practices within a particular society and across societies. So with male circumcision, there are just very stark differences in the way that that is treated in the US and the UK context, which are the two contexts you know you and I know know the best. As you say, in the US context, it's a it's a, a routine um, procedure that a large number of baby boys will be will undergo. In the UK, it's absolutely not. It's a minority procedure that most boy, baby boys will not undergo. And if you look at the 
um, the advice, the parent facing advice offered by the main clinical bodies in the US and the UK, you see that they treat this procedure incredibly differently. So in the NHS parent facing pages about circumcision, they talk about whether or not it might be a necessary procedure to resolve various clinical conditions, and they describe it as a treatment of last resort for those conditions and that it is rarely necessary. Um, they mention that it is occasionally done for um, cultural or religious reasons, but they mention it and that's the end of the story. And the implication you get from reading the NHS web website is that it's not a clinical procedure in all but a very small number of cases. It may sometimes be a cultural procedure, but that's not for the NHS to discuss because it's not a cultural authority. In the UK, in the, in the US, if you look at the how the American Academy of Pediatrics deals with circumcision, they deal with it very much as a clinical procedure. And they describe the way that circumcision might interact with various health conditions, the way it might help to prevent various health conditions. And they say that it can be, um, I think the phrase is something like on balance, the benefits outweigh the risks, but they say that it's not, the benefits are not strong enough to recommend the procedure, but they very much write as if most parents will, and that's probably what they ought to do. And they also talk about the cultural reasons um, the fact that circumcision is culturally recognized as being something that is in its favor, right? That that might be a reason you might choose to, to do it. And again, that's from a clinical body making that judgment rather than a, a, a body representing a particular cultural group. So well, one, real... one... Sorry. Well, just one point you make uh, that we touched on a little bit before is we like to think that there's a distinction between clinical procedures and cultural procedures. And we think there's a clear line between them. The clinical procedures are the ones that are medically necessary. They're therefore advisable and no one should really raise any complaints about them. Whereas the cultural procedures, those are the ones that maybe are importing these problematic norms that we should be resistant to. And I think you just beautifully use the example of male circumcision in the book among other procedures to show how our very notions of what counts as a clinical procedure is something that we designate as something medical as opposed to cultural is itself informed by prior norms. It's not an, another instance of carving nature at the joints where we can just easily distinguish one set of practices from the other. And I'll just say- Absolutely. For, I just yeah, want to say ahead. in this case, that this is something where, you know, your work is clearly, you know, I, I draw on your work and your work is, is superb in pointing this out. And so I don't want to give the impression that, you know, I have originated this observation. This is something that you point out so brilliantly in your own work and anybody interested in circumcision will undoubtedly know your work already but if they don't they should they should read it well thank you I, I will say that Claire actually discusses this example among others at great length toward the end of the book so uh, for listeners who are interested in the example of male circumcision there's a very good and lengthy discussion of it in the book um, okay so someone says could you say a bit about how your argument differs from or engages with the tradition of feminist theorizing as well as some elements of critical race theory queer theory and crip theory that challenge precisely the social pressures to modify bodies that you describe. Yeah, so I do engage with um, many other approaches. So um, I don't think I could kind of give a clear account of all of that without basically reading the whole book <laughs> out to you. Um, but the chapter of disability draws heavily on um, disability rights theory. I talk about the, the social model of disability as it contrasts with the medical model of disability. I talk mm -hmm. about the intersections between um, disability and other identities. So I use the work of Eli Clare, who's an amazing um, disability rights theorist who also thinks about um, transgender rights and identity. Um, uh, what were the other? There was a long list of different things, different traditions of feminism. There's a whole chapter about the way that feminists. Yeah, you've got eco feminism nature. in there, um, don't yeah. you? And uh, yeah. yeah, you've got a, many different traditions that, that come yeah. together and you kind of play them off against each other, which I really like. Yeah, so I, in no way do I claim to have dealt with everything and to have read everything and to be an expert on everything, but I do hope that I've given a good diverse range of uh, attention to a good diverse range of, of sources and voices. Yeah, and I agree with that. That's my impression of the book as well, but definitely um, people should read it and, and form their own judgment about that. Um, this person asks, listen, I understand why you go for a structural account of bodily injustice or, or pressure, not wanting to place blame on individuals. You don't want to individualize the problem of these unjust social pressures. But this person asks an interesting question. Well, are there no cases where individuals can be blamed or at least held responsible for modifying their body in line with, say, patriarchal norms? Mm -hmm. So this person has in mind influencers, like social media influencers, mm -hmm. who on the one hand are individuals. The point of being an, an influ influencer is sharing your private life. But on the other hand, they're business people making plenty of money by modifying their bodies to look thinner, et cetera. Um, so, well, you get the gist of the question here. Yeah. So, you know, where, where, where should we be saying 
you oughtn't to modify your body because by doing so, you're uh, negligently or culpably reinforcing the very norms that you critique in your book. Yeah, that's such a great question. And it's an incredibly difficult question. So I think influencers clearly do cross a line between on the one hand, they are just themselves and doing what they want to do. And on the other hand, they are selling or pushing or, or, or trying to persuade others, right? So an influencer perhaps crosses that line over into a more structural, you know, part of the structural problem, right? Once you're very actively trying to get people to copy you and do what you do, then, then I think it becomes less of a question of individual choice and more a question about the ethics of persuasion of others. But the general question, which I, I still don't know the answer to, and I've thought about it a lot, is what obligation, if any, do we have as individuals rather than as explicit influencers? To, um, to resist uh, oppressive structures, not just for our own good, but because of the impact, impact we have on others. Right? That's a very difficult question. We all conform to social norms in a myriad of ways every day, day in, day out. And many of those conforming um, procedures to social norms are utterly innocuous. Like when I say hello to you and I see you, right? I reinforce the social norm that we ought to say hello or something similar on, on greeting. And I make other people think, oh yes, this is the right thing to do. And I reinforce that social norm, something that you know, Michel Foucault points out, right? Power is re reported and repeated every day in these small interactions. Um, so all of us are influencing each other all the time. We, in our behavior, we reinforce the idea that how we behave is the right way of behaving. And we do that even if we don't explicitly state an instruction, you know, you must all do what I do. Does that mean then we have a duty to always do the right thing, to always act in a resisting way, to always do the thing that would be most compatible with resistance and progress? I don't think it can. I think that is far too demanding. I think that would be um, inconsistent with, with liberty, right? But then where to draw the line between where our, our liberty stops and where our duty to do good to others by our example um, right. begins? It's a very difficult question. I don't know the answer. I have I've thought about it a lot. If anyone knows well, the answer. Also, it seems like the burden might fall differently on different people. Like some people can, as it were, afford to stick their necks out and challenge the social yes. norm. Others may already be in a vulnerable position and not be able to do so. So there's going to be, you know, even if even if it would be good for someone to challenge a social norm, making it an obligation seems, as you say, too strong. Right. And also uh, some people might be in a position where they are more able to influence what others do. So the cost to an individual of conforming or not conforming is one thing that varies, but so does the impact. Right. So right. you might think that somebody in a position of great uh, visibility has more obligation than somebody who is not in that position. Right. A very interesting question comes from Jeff here. Um, the language and style of this argument is analytical, but its conclusion is surprising. I'm wondering whether the same argument that you're making, Claire, but applied to the mind rather than the body is something you would support. That is, should we resist external pressures to change our minds? Uh, if, if you uh, do not support the inviolability of the mind, what's the reasoning for the difference? Oh, wow. I feel if we should resist pressures to change our minds, that I don't think I know where that would Go. I mean, I guess it, the, the way it goes on, it depends on what you mean by pressure, right? So right. I think- if, Is a are, reason count as pressure? If someone provides right, a reason exactly. for review, right? Yeah, does debate and discussion count as pressure? Does reading a book count as pressure, right? So I'd want to know more about, about that. And I certainly don't think that, you know, philosophy could survive, let alone, you know, human interaction, if any kinds of debate or discussion and attempts at persuasion counted as, um, unjustified pressure to change our minds. But of course, we also do want to, you know, as part of that, we want to hold a space for freedom of opinion, freedom of thought. And that's part of a very um, familiar tradition of liberal, in the broadest sense, liberal thinking. So yeah, that's a fascinating question. The, uh, there's, how to protect our minds. Right. Well, I mean, maybe with all the uh, kind of um, misinformation and um, a disregard for the truth in the public sphere, there is a sense of how do we actually inoculate ourselves against uh, ideas that might be pernicious and that we might not have the resources to uh, contest one by one might be, might be one way of, of thinking about that. Um, this person asks, well, there's two, two interesting questions here. One is, are there good reasons we might have for modifying our bodies that float free in some sense of these harmful, oppressive, discriminatory structures? For example, modifications that extend or enhance our agency or perhaps our, our identity. Uh, and this other person asks, hello, how do you see your message is different from body positivity? You know, mm. uh, how's, how's saying your body is good enough as it is, you know, meaningfully different from long traditions of saying, you know, you're good enough as you are. 
Great, thank you. Okay, so the first one, um, I'm just making notes, I didn't forget the two questions. So the first question was about um, modifications that might enhance us in various ways. And I deliberately in the book do not discuss um, in enhancements of functioning, right? I just bracket that aside. There was a huge rich literature on that question and I, and I just, just don't go there. So the modifications that I'm thinking about are primarily those that are motivated by one of three broad um, principles, either appearance or um, identity or health understood, not as enhancement above some kind of normal functioning, but the restoration of health or something like that. So I, I simply don't look at enhancement in the functioning sense. But I do think about modifications that might make us um, fit with those three goals in a better way. And one of the examples I talk about in the book is where modification gets used as a form of creativity or as a form of self-care or as a form of reclamation of the body. And I have a beautiful photograph in the book of a woman who has had a tattoo um, on her mastectomy scars. So she has suffered from a mastectomy and has had a tattoo to, um, in the way she describes it, to reclaim her body and to make her body feel more like her own and less like the body that the surgeons created when she had her mastectomy. And I discuss how there's a kind of growing um, number of women engaging in tattooing as a response to mastectomy and, and how that can very often be a real sense of reclamation and finding a new way of belonging and being in your own body. And that can be really um, life affirming. So yeah, I talk about that, but not about the enhancements in terms of, um, you know, adding a uh, new uh, faculty or something like exactly, that through not that computer kind of chips. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's out of scope of the book. Right. Um, body positivity. Okay, great. So um, I do talk at various places about um, body positivity and particularly about um, sort of fat acceptance and um, the idea that we should be happy with our bodies is something that's very strongly come out of that movement. Um, I think that body positivity is really interesting because on the one hand, <clears throat> absolutely body positivity is better than body negativity. No question. Let's go for body positivity every time. Um, one area of questioning is whether body positivity actually demands too much of us. Like whether it demands not only that we um, are, are sort of have have a particular relationship with our bodies, but that we also have an extra duty to feel good about our bodies and whether that creates another way to fail, right? I don't love my body. Um, mm. There's a brilliant um, a song that I quote in the book by uh, Rachel Lark and the Damaged Goods, which is called All the Other Women Should Love Their Bodies, But I Want to Lose Five Pounds. It's a great um, yeah, song. You can quote. see it on YouTube. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so there's a question about, you know, whether that's another standard that we can fail, but for sure I'm um, in favor of body positivity rather than body negativity. Um, some people now argue that what we should have rather than body positivity is body neutrality, right, where we just let our bodies be as they are, and that's very much in line with the idea of the unmodified body, as I put it. It may be that we need to do body positivity before we can get to body neutrality, right? So mm -hmm. the questions of what kinds of activist movements we might need to undertake, um, how we should go together doing this is not something that I can answer. The body positivity movement, body neutrality movement may well be part of that. And it's really clear that really some quite simple things like having a social media feed that has images of diverse bodies rather than images of perfect bodies makes a real difference, right? There's evidence to back that up. Um, you can feel it anecdotally if you <laughs> expose yourself to certain kind of images, not others. Um, and the body positivity movement can be a really important part of that by showcasing um, diverse bodies and people who are happy with their bodies. So yeah, to be applauded for sure.